I knew it was always there. I could be anybody, anywhere, any car, any condition. Full stop. Mm. I was so, so confident. The first thought was I thought I'd lost my legs from the knee down. Suddenly this ball I was on, there was this massive pin that just went pop. Yeah. And it sort of, everything looked as if, I think, you know, it was gonna disappear. Michael had said in, in, a, in a German magazine that uh, if, that's, if Johnny thinks he's gonna win a world championship, he's got another thing coming. The team had suddenly, to me, had sort of split. But there has to be a bit of selfishness as part of it. Intimidation is a big part. Max has definitely got a lot of that intimidation. We all want to see Max challenged, and even Max wants to have a challenge as well. We still haven't seen the best of Max. We haven't? No. He's not peaked yet. If Max has those negative feelings or uh, uh, thoughts, I don't know. It is the power that, that, that Lewis could bring to Ferrari. The greats of the sport always are able to keep on moving with the times. Hi everybody, a warm welcome to In The Zone, a series brought to you by Gambling Zone, your trusted online gambling comparison site. Uh, I'm Manish Basin, and in each, every episode, I talk to one of the biggest names in sport, charting their journey to the very top, their highs and their lows. And today's special guest is a former Formula One driver. He took part in 160 races over an 11 year period. Um, three wins to his name, seven podium finishes, his highlight, no doubt, winning the British Grand Prix in 1995 and amongst his teammates, the legendary Michael Schumacher. There's only one Johnny Herbert and he joins me now. <laughs> I was going to say, here's Johnny. It was yeah. too tempting. <laughs> no, thankfully, there's only one of me. <laughs> <as well. laughs> How are you, Johnny? Good yeah, to see you. really good. Yeah, everything's good. It's good at home. Wife and grandchildren, daughters are really doing well. So, yeah, it's... It's uh, it's a nice peaceful time for me. I'm sixty yeah. this year. You're not sixty, really? My lord! Yeah, you look great for quick. it. Thank you, you very much. Well. A lot of push, moving things backwards. <laughs> <laughs> and, and dare I say, you're probably looking forward to the new F1 season. Yeah, pretty much. Um, of course, last year was, and a very a very impressive year from from Max and Red Bull. Mm. Hopefully, we're going to have a slightly closer battle. Um, he's hoping there's hoping for sure but uh, yeah looking forward to it because you know there's a lot of stories as always going on within the paddock mm. and uh, a lot of expectations and i've got a lot, lot of expectations as well so yeah. hopefully it's good hopefully it's going to be a good one i'm sure it will be uh, interesting you use the term story so let's start with your personal story first <laughs> of all because I, I have to say when you dig a little bit deeper behind someone's you know personal journey i find it fascinating and yours is up there as being one of the most fascinating. So, born in Essex in Brentwood, uh, what was your childhood like? Yeah, okay, not in Brentwood. I was only there for six months. Oh, really? And then I went to Collier Road, just oh, outside okay. Romford. So I got brought up there, lovely fields at the back of me, could go out there and play, as I did in the early days, a bit of golf, a bit of football. The school was just literally across that uh, field as well, a comprehensive Forest Lodge. And uh, yeah, the upbringing was, was really good. It was, football was something my dad did. He played for the cricketers, I think they were on Sunday. Um, and we used to go along to do that. I played a little bit when I was at school, but wasn't Hang on, really... your dad played football for the cricketers? The cricketers, it was right. called the cricketers. Okay, yes, yeah. exactly. Just yeah. wanted to carry yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> Yes, can't remember, it was in late. And he played cricket for the yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, he did, we did a little, little bit of that at weekends, but that was sort of, Sort of it. I went to a couple of trials to, you know, certain teams in in the area. Failed on getting into a team <laughs> from from that point of view. I was always again. I was very shy uh, as a, as a youngster. So I was the one sort of going, can, can I can I have the ball, please? You were shy. So I, yeah, I wasn't the one shouting and screaming yeah. like some of the other the other kids were doing at the time. But uh, then karting came into my life when I was about six. I think it was. I used to go to Holland holiday and in Cornwall. And my uncle, strangely enough, was running the local sort of holiday go-kart track. And that's where it all basically started there. My parents would drop me off a, a couple of days during the holiday and I would just thrash around 
all day long. So it was yes. your uncle a keen driver then? No, no, there's nothing in the family where there was anything about with motorsport, to be honest. So it's one of those weird situations that when I, when I started it, there just seemed to be this natural ability there even when i was six seven and then eight years eight years old oh, that's really and then it sort of grew yeah right from that so were you the archetypal kind of f1 fanatic when you No, we used to go to brands hatch yeah to watch the banger racing and watch the banger i don't know what you call it banger racing caravan yeah. bangers whatever they were called um and that was the only thing that we sort of did i think watching Formula One television, I must admit, I don't really remember it until I was probably about eight or ten years old when it, a karting, mm. racing came into into our lives. So that And that's probably about 74, something like that, 73, 74. I think that was the first first time I saw a Formula One car. And first, my thir first thoughts I always remember was, I want to do that. Yeah. So I'm going to be able to do that. So I was, I say, karting. And I just thought it was karting Formula One. <laughs> it wasn't quite There's a little the case. bit in between. It was just that little bit yeah. in between I wasn't really yeah. aware of. But uh, yeah, the bug bit very, very early. Karting, yes, like everybody else, every single driver on the Formula One grid uh, started from. Um, and then, yeah, then that journey towards Formula One started. Yeah. And that bit in between for you uh, and for many other drivers, F3 plays a big part. Yeah. Uh, and of course, you won the title under Eddie Jordan. Indeed. Um, also, F3000 was also there. Now, I know before you claimed the F3 title, mm. you had the chance to test drive with Benetton. Mm -hmm. And things were going swimmingly, um, but at Formula 3000, when you've just had a taste of F1, this incredible thing happened, which almost derailed your career mm. before it even begun. Yeah. It's been seen as, or been talked about as one of the worst crashes seen in F3000. Can, can you take me back to that day? I don't know like about it. At Brands I don't like talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, every, everything that had been going on from Formula Ford is where you go from karting to, to motorsport with uh, little gear sticks as they used to have in those days. And won the Formula Ford Festival. Then you're sort of elevating, suddenly people are starting to talk about you. Then I had my first Formula 3 test, went very, very well at the same time, won the Formula 3 uh, championship with, uh, with Eddie Jordan, who obviously had his own dream of mm. getting to Formula 1, which he did as a, as a team owner. And then of course, Formula 3000, but Benetton, Peter Collins had sort of started watching me mm. and were very impressed what was happening when I was doing Formula 3, got the test um, for, for the Benetton at Brands Hatch and went faster than Thierry Bootsen, who was the, the driver or one of the drivers at the time. So it was all this momentum that was going. I sort of explain it a little bit like a ball. When I started in the early days of karting, it was a tiny little marble, mm. the ball. And then as you grow with confidence and you hear your name being spoken about, the results start to come. That ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And had those tests, everything had gone very, very well. I then had a, another test, um, Lotus, uh, Peter War, um, was, was very interesting as well. And the week before we went to Brands Hatch for the Formula 3000 race, I tested uh, for the Lotus, went faster than Nelson Piquet, who yeah. was the current world champion uh, at the time. So again, everything was going earlier in the season. You're turning heads at this point. Yeah, even Enzo Ferrari. I, I, and sadly, he died at the end of um, 89, I think it was. Um, and he wanted to meet me, which sadly we never, we never did meet, but, uh, or maybe it's 88. Anyway, um, but this ball I was talking about when I went to Brands Hatch for qualifying was so, so big and I'm sort of standing on top of it. And I, and I always I didn't think it, but I knew it was always there. I could be anybody, anywhere, any car, any condition, full stop. Mm. I was so, so confident. Went to Brands uh, after that test, got pole position, I think in my, because it was two groups of qualifying, I think I was one second faster than everybody else in my group. Martin Donnelly, who had just joined the team, uh, was my teammate, I was half a second faster than him. Then the start of the race on Sunday, I basically sort of disappeared, I had a 12 sec second lead. Then there was an accident, so they stopped the race, mm. reformed on the grid didn't get the perfect start on the second uh, second restart. But I wasn't worried because it was a two-part race. So they were, I had 12 seconds in my pocket, effectively. So it didn't really matter. I'd take my time. I knew I had the speed. Didn't panic. Um, and then as we went on to the Grand Prix circuit, Gregor Wojtek, 
who I'd had a coming together at the beginning of the season, um, try to overtake me. I still feel he, he had to have gone partly on the grass. And there's a bridge that halfway down, as you go on the Grand Prix circuit towards uh, Hawthorne Corner, and he just clipped the rear of my car, which then just turned sharp left. And where the bridge is, normally on any racetrack, even back in those days, the Armco Barrow just went sort of down the hill, up the hill, round Hawthorne, just straight. Mm. But it came out around the footing of the bridge. So where it comes out, that's where I go straight into it and go head on. And that just sort of destroys the whole front of the car. My legs are hanging out the front of the car. It spins across the track. And unfortunately, I went head on on the other side. Um, so I think it was about 160 when I first made, made uh, the first um, uh, uh, crash. And then I am probably was still doing about 130, 140 <laughs> wow. when, I, when I did it with my legs <clears> hanging <throat> out, which is where all the damage uh, was done from that point of view. And I remember the dust setting. I've seen the video. Um, yeah, oh, the whole quite end a, of the car's gone. Yes. Your legs are just poking out. Yeah, poking out. out the front, exactly. And it was quite a good scene because there were just cars everywhere. Yeah. It was absolute carnage. Ca that's the one, carnage. I think only about five or six cars actually got to the to the grid when they red flagged it. I think that was all that was all that was left. And they yeah. had to patch them all up to get them out for the race that, that, that went on afterwards. But um, I can just remember my opening my eyes and all I could see was the whole where, where your feet are, your knees are like that, your feet and the pedals. And I could just see the top of my knees and then just the, all the trees that, that are there at the Grand Prix circuit at Brands Hatch. So the first thought was I thought I'd lost my legs from the knee down. I thought they disappeared. I just remember putting the head back and going, knock me out, knock me out, knock me out, knock me out. And then I came around eventually in, in hospital. I do remember seeing them bandaged up, covered in blood and everything else, but they were still there. So I knew I still had my feet but I still didn't know how much damage was done. So all this journey that I'd been on towards Formula One, because the morning of, of, the, of the race, Sir Frank Williams came down the pit lane as well and wanted to meet me after the race as well. So suddenly this ball I was on, there was this massive pin that just went pop. Yeah. And it sort of, everything looked as if, I think, you know, it was going to disappear. What did the doctor say to you? Amputation. I don't remember it personally, but I know my, my girlfriend or my wife now, uh, my parents, uh, Peter Collins, I think, was there as well. They were kind of wanting to amputate my left foot because that was sort of hanging on by a piece of skin anyway. And they didn't think it was going to take. And, they, and everybody sort of went, no, 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 you've got to try mm. just to try to put it on. They said, oh, the infection is going to be the biggest problem with it. And then it can spread sort of further up. Yeah. But they said, OK, well, you don't want it off so we're and there were two ways of doing it there was either you clean it and really make it as clean as you possibly can but of course the more it's open mm. the more chance of infection so they did a quick clean and then just basically stitched it stitched it back on and then had a little drain for the sort of stuff to to come out and thankfully it it took and there was almost a fear that you might never walk again right yeah well that again that's all i think it's always the worst scenario a surgeon or a doctor is always going to be the worst scenario oh, so right. yes yeah, so i was always going to have a stick i'd never drive a, a racing car uh, <laughs> ever again but of course in my head that's not that's not how i'm wired i'm wired to still i'm i'm still there this is still thinking exactly the same as it was before so for me it's it's changed but it's only a visual change and mm. i think i can I think I can overcome it. And I'm glad I had that mentality because obviously Where does that, that resilience that did happen. come from? I don't know. Uh, again, with my, with my parents and, and uncles and cousins and everything else, you know, sport was never really such a big, a big, a big deal, as I, as I said in my earlier, earlier days. So I think it's like anything. There's a, there's a dream. There's a desire. There is all those positive feelings, as I said, with all the other, the Formula One teams who were so interested in me. So I felt that was still, it was still there. It was still touchable mm. for me. Although my foot was, you know, really, in fact, in a really bad state. My right foot was dislocated. My heel is actually around the side. It's not actually on where it should be. So it's quite hard to walk. Yeah. <laughs> on the heel I've got Pretty at the moment. Picture. Yeah, I keep falling over. Anyway, um, but... I, I, I thought, right, I would just give it everything I've got. And if it doesn't work, I know I gave it my best. How? And I think that was, that was the mentality I had. Was it really six months? And only six months after that, you made your F1 debut? Yeah. 
and you finished yeah. fourth on your debut. Yeah. Which good, was I'm good, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> which was seen as like the most stunning debut I mean Murray yeah. Walker I remember yeah. you know which yeah. I couldn't quite believe it at the yeah. time that you were coming in at fourth Nigel Mansell won the race he did in the um, but had never done more than about three laps it was the first <laughs> of the paddle shifted Formula 1 cars is that right and that was the first race for it and all the testing they'd done it failed so so badly they went there thinking we ain't got a chance yeah. and then Nigel went out there and won the race but again as you said I, I finished fourth yeah which was Still amazing when I look back now, I can take a couple of steps back, not very well, but take a couple of <laughs> steps back and sort of go, wow, that, that was impressive considering this. if you're normal, normal with, you know, normal feet and everything, it's still impressive. Yeah. But being I was only, a, I was going around on a red bike around the circuit and around the paddock um, and I wasn't able to walk very far. It was only about six steps, I think it was at the time I was picked up. I was sort of slotted in the car uh, before the race. Um, but yeah, wow. But to, uh, to be able to achieve that was career, yeah. career saving. Now, look, to be ways. honest, I think from there on in, whatever you achieved, I think almost pales into some insignificance. Mm. But you still can't downplay the fact that you won the British Grand Prix no. in 1995. Um, obviously, there was a collision in the build up, mm -hmm. which was interesting, involving. Damon uh, and Michael. Damon Hill and yes. Michael Schumacher. Thank you, Damon. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the moment, I suppose, which many people got many people to stand up and take notice. Mm -hmm. Johnny Herbert, I mean, this fellow needs no introduction, but we now know what he's capable of doing. Is that when you realised, or you kind of, the penny dropped that you know, you'd arrived? Um, I, I don't know. I don't think I was thinking it that way, because, of course, I'd been with Lotus... Um, uh, after coming back from that, because so, you know, basically I had the, 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 the six races I did with Benetton in, in 89. I went to Japan basically for rehab in 1990 and 91. I did uh, two races at the end of 1990 when Martin Donnelly had his mm. unbelievable crash that he's, he survived that, which is much, much bigger than my one. But I did two races and then I joined Mika Hakkinen in 91 uh, at Lotus. And together we'd sort of had a good battle and then there was that opportunity when sadly Lotus came mm. came came to its end. And then I then I joined Benetton for two races at the end of ninety four when I replaced, strangely enough, Jos Verstappen, Max's Max's yeah. father, yeah. Uh, for those two races. Then I joined the team full time in ninety five with Michael, um, going for his second world championship. So I thought that was my opportunity of winning a world championship because that's always been been the dream and I always remember saying it right at the very beginning of the season I remember then Michael or being told by journalist Michael had said in, in, a, in a German magazine that uh, if that's if Johnny thinks he's going to win a world championship he's got another thing coming yeah and he was absolutely right <laughs> <laughs> but it come on from tough. a teammate yeah who also wouldn't let you look at his data <clears throat> sure but that's but that's what I probably expect it's not the way I would do it because I would just want to prove that I'm the best anyway but Michael would work very, very hard to make sure, and I totally understand it, of working as hard as he possibly could to make sure it worked for him. And it did work for him. Flavio Buratori was, was, I found he was frustrating for me. He wasn't supportive of me as much as he was with Michael. But then I can understand with the success he had with Michael, well, it worked. He Is that why you think he was goal. so successful? It was because he had that almost selfishness in him. Yeah, definitely so. And I think you've got to have that. I think you see that today with Max Verstappen, for example. Yeah. Is it is it is it not a nice thing? No, it's just a different way of going about your given sport. But there is only you in the cockpit, so you you're the one who's got to try and make sure when you step in there and slide yourself in there, seat belts are done up, visor down, and off you go. But at the beginning of the race. It's working for you. So there has to be a bit of selfishness as part of it. And the teams do try very, very hard to try and make it as equal as they possibly can. But then human nature comes into effect. Because if you know one of them guarantees you're going to win a race or win the World Championship, you are going to go that Eggs way. Eggs in one basket. Yeah. And, and I get But do that. you wish Briatore got involved? 
Sorry? Do you wish Flavio Briatore got involved just to maybe have a word with Michael? Well, it was like the data thing, you know. The data thing was always... The negotiations we had, they were, they were Benetton were very much trying to get the Constructors' Championship, which they hadn't done the World Championship, mm. and they hadn't achieved that before. So I always remember it was, we're a team, we're together, we want to win the Constructors' Championship, so we need to work together to get the best out of each other to be able to do that. And then when I got to the second Grand Prix... Um, and then that was when Michael had a word with Flavio and said, I don't want Johnny to see my data. Um, and Flavio went, yeah, that's OK. And you sort of go, but we just had sort of discussions only mm. a couple of months ago where it was all a team. So the team had suddenly, to me, had sort of split. And I was one side of the wall and Michael was, was, was the other side with Flavio. And OK, I can probably say maybe I didn't deal with it in the right way but I, I expected it to be tough but I didn't expect it to come from the leader of the team for example I expected it to come from Michael just being as quick as as Michael uh, was um, so it just made it a little bit more difficult and I felt a little bit more alone and that probably was something you've got to be strong I think someone like Kimi Raikkonen for example doesn't care he has he's just got this total inner belief and doesn't really get drawn into all the other goings on within a team for example he's massively talented of course yeah. but there are certain characters Max is one of those as well I think Lewis is, a, is another one etc where they can deal with all that added pressure but I don't think they've ever been in a position where the team boss isn't on your side and sometimes you, you need that in any sport any sport. So it was a functional relationship between you and Michael. Is that how you describe it? Yeah, it was. It was a good relationship. We, you know, he had a great sense of humour. Still got a great sense of humour, and that came out even in when we had our debriefs after a practice or a race, for example. Um, but he was very serious when he needed to, and he mm. was very good at getting those people to focus on what he was doing throughout that weekend, but have a little bit of fun to go with it, a little bit of downtime, if you want to call it that way. But yeah, it was, he was mighty impressive how he went about how he, how he went about his racing. And talking of Michael, I mean, I, I, I wanted to go initially back to your kind of, your journey, but mm. as we're talking about, you know, such a legendary figure, mm. are you in touch with him or his family at all? No, no, it's all very very quiet I think it's, and it's something when he was racing it was always a very similar thing he didn't want people to know how he worked because then he th I think he thought if people knew how I clicked they'd find a way of unclicking it mm. and then causing me sort of issues so it was always very much controlled um, with how he went about his racing the family and everything else and I think that's the same scenario we've got now unfortunately after that skiing accident you know there's a lot of fans and even i'd like to know exactly what mm. what is going on where he's at has he has he improved in any way or whatever but it's it's a horrible it's a horrible thing for someone who's been so successful in the sport but um that's the way it goes i can look back and say well it wasn't fair that i had the accident that i had at the time i had it and it wasn't fair with with michael either life's life's a bit of a funny old thing sometimes yeah. But, you know, it's, it's such a curious situation. Mm. It's been 11 years or thereabouts yeah. since the skiing accident. And there is still so much intrigue and interest in Michael. Yeah. I suppose that kind of shows just, you know, how big an mm. individual he became within the sport. Yeah. You know, we, People are we, pining to know. No, sure. But we, we lost Ayrton Senna, yeah. you know, back in, in 94. And his name is still huge. People still want to know about Ayrton and Michael is very, very similar from that point of view because, mm. we, it, and unfortunately in some ways, when he, when he went from, went for, from Ferrari and, and went to Mercedes, there was this sort of Michael that I knew behind the scenes that was there, but you never saw it on TV or through a camera lens because he was always very protective, as I said, of what he was trying to achieve, which was to win races and win a world championship. Mm. But there was a much softer, nicer Michael that you visually saw when he was at Mercedes in his, in his last, last few years there. But um, yeah, there's always interest of, you know, how characters go about their racing. And, you know, he was one of those special ones, you know, achieved those seven world championships. Um, and there's a well factor about him. So hope, hopefully, let's, let's hope that there is going to be some some news of technology that you know is going to be our science is yeah. going to be able to sort of 
you know, see him in the in the paddock again. I hope so, Fingers and I'm sure that's a dream for for everybody. When you were driving, you've already, you know, said a few names: um, Nelson Piquet, mm -hmm. John Alesi. Even for me, that feels like a heyday of Formula One. I mean, but I suppose everybody has their own heyday. Yeah, sure. I mean, kids today, it's all about Verstappen, yeah. no doubt. But yeah. I think the celebrity start a part of F1 really came to its fall around the time when you were driving then. And you know the trappings that come with it, I, mm. I suppose, with such money and fame, mm. um, Monaco, the yachts and parties. Was it something you were aware of? And did you see other individuals whose career might have gone on to better things had they not been swallowed up by all the things that come with F1 back then? Yeah, I, again, I, I think there are stars that we never saw before I got in Formula One. Tommy Byrne uh, is one of those who was a very rare, a rare uh, person as far as the, you know, the, the, the speed that he had in a racing car. Totally natural, but he never quite worked out for him and we never really saw him in the best, uh, the best cars. Um, and then latterly, Tom, I always think Tom Christensen, you know, a multiple winner of Le Mans, but we never saw him uh, race a Formula One car. So there are many that should have, could have, um, but for whatever reason, it doesn't quite pan out. And that happens, I think, you know, across across the board of sports for sure. But I think Formula One especially, because there's only those 20, 20 odd drivers that you know have that chance in one given year so it's a, it's a it's a it's a tough one i was luckier because there were 26 cars mm. on the grid so there were 26 drivers of course as it shrunk that's that makes it that little bit more difficult for for the spaces i guess you've got to be in the right place at the right time you know formula two the, the one down from formula one you can dominate that but if there's not a space after you've won that championship you've got to have a little bit of luck for something to open up very, very quickly. Because the problem is with, I think most sports, but especially in motorsport, you can sort of wait for that spot to happen in say, like, say a couple of years, then the next generation comes along. Suddenly the next man that everybody's talking about, or lady everybody's talking about getting in a Formula One car, you suddenly get forgotten. Mm. So sometimes, yeah, you've just got to have the right things happening at, at the right time. But is it easy to lose your focus, though, with, with, with those trappings? No, uh, I suppose there's always, there's always the drive to be enjoying your driving. And I've been very fortunate that I, I got, got, got into a Formula One car, but I also drive, love driving a sports car uh, and racing at Lamar as well. So there are other things outside the bubble of Formula One as well, which many people have not quite made it, but actually done very, Tom, as I said, has been very successful in making a wonderful career in, in, uh, in, in sports cars. So there are different avenues and opportunities, but as I said, there are only so many limited slots that are, that are there. And the teams, when I started, there wasn't realistically, there weren't teams with their um, academies, for example, bringing on the next generation like Red Bull, mm. for example, um, and all the other teams. That didn't exist when I was coming through. You had to sort of just prove it. Then Peter Collins, as I said, at Benetton noticed me that then helped me do my first test. And testing was a big deal back then as well, because you actually went to a track and you drove it mm. around the track. Now, the first time that we've seen an F1 car on a track this season was was just before before the race itself. So it's a very different different thing now. It's all the simulators that they they use nowadays. You have simulator drivers, so there are successful drivers mm. in F2 who get a job as a sim driver. But he's not a Formula One no. driver. It's like, a, but that, it's like an extra in a film. Yes, yeah, yeah sort of thing. Yeah. And But that's where it's sort of, it just has changed so, so much. So I was very fortunate that I got track time to go, for people to go, wow. Yeah. Because then they saw me, where you don't see that so much now. What did you feel of the constant pressure of being a number two in the team um, when you know that, you know, you're one race away from having that seat taken away from mm. you? I think also around the time when you won the, the British yes. Grand Prix, Jos was lurking in the background. Jos you know? was lurking in the background. Flavio was spreading rumours as well. About that can't have been I nice. Was, it's not nice. As I said, you know, it was something that you don't... You don't wish on any other driver, to be honest, to be under that much pressure. Um, but 
Did it affect you? But then that pressure is part of it. I, I, in that particular given time, no, because I decided that I've got to, just got to try and focus on the race. I knew I was never going to get the best out of the, out of the, uh, the qualifying. Mm. And I knew that, you know, where are the points and the, and the podiums? So, well, that's in the race. So I had to make sure that I was more um, um, better to get the car around the circuit in the fastest way for me to then able to produce and be in the right position at the right time, like I was at Silverstone, so I was third, and then Damon um, clashed with, with Michael, and then I was leading the race, and then I ended up winning it. So it's, it was just a different focus. Yes, the pressure is always there. The pressure, you're always under pressure, um, especially if you're not winning all the time, mm. because then you're, you're expected to win, and you're the man that everybody is behind. If it's the team, if it's the fans, um, it's it's a different thing but when you're still as i felt i was always proving myself having to prove myself it's pressure but then there is a motivation to keep on fighting you know and getting yourself in a position where you can win races um but then you can be a team leader even in a team that maybe you can't win races but you can throw in a surprise performance over a weekend even that's satisfying my best race wasn't my my win at silverstone my best race i ever did in formula one i finished fourth in malaysia in 1999 when i was driving for stewart so it's not particularly Why? about it just everything that weekend it's it, when it goes back to my accident because everything i did before that ball i was talking about i found it was very very easy very easy. I didn't have to think about it. I didn't have to have a, a, a dark piece of tarmac or a bit of grass, darker grass. That's where I break, then I turn in. It was just done in this 180 degree vision of everything. And when I look forward now, I've got all the cameras there, I've got your microphone, my microphone, your face, my face on the TV over there. I take all that like a computer and it all gets absorbed. Then you know exactly where you are. And after the accident, I didn't have that anymore so this feeling i could drive any car or any condition Fun. anywhere blah, 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 disappeared it came back once 1999 Malaysia. in Malaysia. no idea wish i do it because it's just a moment pure clarity. it just all came to the whole weekend it just all came together and i don't know why because the, the feet the sensations i get in the feet is just completely different from what i had before just because of the damage that's there my toes don't bend my ankles not my ankles my ankles don't really bend very much but everything all the bones got sort of broken so it's all quite rigid mm. so you haven't got all this like fingers i'm doing all this which is what you do with your toes and i can't do that so this so the sensations and the feelings you get are not the same but it came back that day and i don't and i frust so you could frustrate me yes and sell it <laughs> <laughs> there might be a fair few very takers. weird very very weird yeah. but it, it was lovely because that was sort of you know in the latter part of my career to, you know i was 19 and then did 2000 but it at least i got that sensation back once which was which was really nice. frustrating Amazing, yeah. but really nice yeah. in terms of the evolution of today's formula one drivers do you feel they have to be more canny? They're almost operating at different levels. You talk about that clarity, actually, mm. but the ability to take on so much information now that's more available now than ever, ever. before. Yeah, exactly. But also to rely on their raw talent to take that machine around 60, 70. Yeah, I, th I think what I, when I, what I think is, is the biggest difference from when I started and went to my first race in, in Brazil in, in 89. I had no idea of what was inside that bubble. Didn't know what the media were going to be like. I didn't know anything really, because I'd never really, I'd never been to a Grand Prix in the paddock back yeah, before, I, before I went to, to Brazil. All these guys know everything about it before they step in the paddock mm. for the first time. And then when they've done that a couple of times, they, then they step in there as a, as a racing driver. So then you've got all the training they have for, for media. We, again, we didn't do that type of stuff. It's something you learnt as you went through, through the, the processes. Um, and then you've got the cars themselves. They do all this simulator work years before they've even got close to being in a Formula One car. So they, I think they seem to be able to absorb so much more at a much, much younger age as well. You know, I was, I was 24, I think it was, when I got into Formula One. I was 19 when I went into, from karting to Formula Ford. Max was in Formula One at 17. Mm. It's a total, total different world with all the information we had. 
Ah, one thing I did have, I had a telephone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a telephone, just with a keypad, and it was the brick. <laughs> so it was just different. Yeah. It's just, you know, all the information that they've got on the phones, the simulators they have at home, yeah. the games. We didn't have games. They can come out until the, the 90s, mid-90s, something like that. So it's just a very different world. But what does impress me with all those social media pressures that you've got, the normal media pressures you, that you've got, the expectations that you've got from your sponsors and partners within a team. It's, you know, there's a massive amount of weight on their shoulders. But then you look at Max and Lewis and they just seem to just... <laughs> or Tiger Woods when Tiger Woods came in, for example. It's, it's, it's a very different mentality that they've got, but it's mainly because they just have a much much more information at a much younger age and they learn how to process it much easier and that's also when you include social media mm. and the scrutiny that comes with that yeah that's what I mean is it an extra mm. pressure that's on there I think you've got to be a, a type of character that can say don't need that don't need to read any of that stuff I'm just here to do my job enjoy my job that I do and then there will there will be Positives and negatives, anyway. And I remember when I was doing my my stuff at Sky, you'd you'd, you'd say, uh, and I would say, right, Lewis, he did a cracking job this weekend to win that race. You get hammered by the Max fans, so then you sort of go the next race. Max, he did the best race, brilliant. I never see, wow, 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 wow. You get hammered by the the Lewis fans. Yeah. Then you go, they both did an incredible <laughs> race this weekend. Then you get hammered by both. <laughs> so you you can never win. Stop sitting on the fence. Yes, you yeah. can never win in, in that scenario. But again, the drivers have to deal with that with all the. Um, you know, Twitter stuff that they have to do for the teams, but they have to do, they do for themselves, for the Instagram stuff or the TikTok stuff that they do. And some of them are very good. Lando Norris, mm -hmm. he's brilliant at it, mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant. And he's brought in, he's one of not only there's, there's a few of them, but he's brought in a, a new younger generation, and they, there's a connection when with with Lando and the fans. So it's just something that's just very very different. And I think as time goes by, it's, it's like anything you learn how to weave your way through that maze in, mm. in a way and get to the you know get to the to the finish line and talking of sky i mean your involvement obviously kind of came to an end yeah. uh, a year or two ago mm -hmm. now uh, having been part of their stable for the best part of a decade yeah um, i mean how disappointing was that and how do you still keep your kind of foot in uh, yeah, it? disappointing, mm. sure, but it's like anything, things move on. I had 11, as Damon Hill said, you've had 11, 11 good years here. And I sort of thought, yeah, yeah, I have. And he, and he was, he, there were some, you know, some really good times as well. Uh, 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 as well. Um, but there's many other things. It's like anything, there's that bubble of Formula 1, as I spoke about at the beginning. There is a, there is a, there is a world outside it as well. So there's many other avenues, different avenues that I've, that I've gone down. Some have worked out as normal, uh, some haven't. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm doing stewarding this year, for example, the FIA Formula One steward. So I'll be in Australia for, my, for, the, for the first race uh, as a steward. Uh, I'm doing six, I think it's six or seven during the year. So even that, I enjoy that because I think it's nice to be someone on that stewarding panel. And they do every race with a, with a driver that does have a bit of a knowledge because everyone else, the other stewards there, don't have a knowledge no. of what it's like in the cockpit. And that's why but they've always put us in there. former F1 driver would, would do that. And I, I think that shows you have no ego no. whatsoever. No, which sometimes is probably, was a problem. Because I always remember after my accident, the only way I could get over the problem that I was having was actually to laugh about it. Because mm. it was my, my way of relieving that pressure. That, that was there. And I remember having a, I think in uh, 94, I think the end of 94, I went to see Ron Dennis at McLaren about driving for, for 95, I think it was, or 96, I remember 95, 96. And I just remember walking in into his office, sitting down, he said, and the first words that came out of his mouth, mouth were, I need to change you. Because I wasn't seen as serious. But of course I was having to laugh about this mm. to... Shrug it off. Somehow, yeah, just sort of get rid of it. it. I never got rid of it. It would always sort of go, bounce and ricochet and then come back again. Oh, damn, <laughs> they're still there. <laughs> but it was my way of doing it. And it got me through. It got me through the very, very early days for sure. But even when it got very difficult, it sort of made me, I suppose, more a bit stronger mm. mentally mm. from that, that point of view. 
Great stuff. Well, look, that's been Johnny's personal story, <laughs> um, but we've got uh, his preview uh, to the new F1 season, which starts in Bahrain uh, in a few days' time. But in the meantime, quick reminder, you're watching In The Zone in association with Gambling Zone, your trusted online gambling comparison site. Welcome back to In The Zone. I'm with former Formula One driver, Johnny Herbert. So, Johnny, the new season's almost upon us kicks off in Bahrain. Now the big question is, who can challenge Max Verstappen and the power of Red Bull? I mean, he's already made it three in a row. Can he make, is he going to make it four? Um, from, again, this is me. When you, when you go testing, I normally try and watch what, what they're like when they come out of the box. And that Red Bull Max looked very good <laughs> coming out of that box. So on day one of the test they had in Bahrain, the three-day test they had, you know, he was 1.1 seconds faster yeah. than Lando North. I don't think that was a true reflection exactly but it's ominous. where they are. Yeah, I think they've just designed another great car once again. They've sort of added lits a bit, little bits of the Mercedes, mm. that uh, the sort of tight bodywork they had on the um, on the side, and that hasn't quite didn't work for Merck. And they've taken little bits but improved it, and it does seem to be working very, very well. But Ferrari have shown some really good pace as well, actually. And I think the key, which is what uh, Charles Leclerc said, is now we seem to have a car that we can control the tyres. They had a lot of problems with tyre uh, degradation issues, and they seem to be in a much better position because of that. So I'm hoping that is actually a sign that the attack on Red Bull will actually be a positive one for, for all of us. Because we all, we all want to see Max challenge, and even Max wants to have a challenge as well, because I think that's the scenario that really does get the best out of Max when he's being raced um, against with the likes of Lewis or Charles, like we've seen in the in the, the last couple of years. Um, but the Red Bull does look very, very, very good, I have to say. But it's going to be one of those things, it's going to be a development year mm. again. Everybody's going to be working on the con um, uh, the concept that they've got, and some of them might come out the out the blocks a little bit slower, like we saw in McLaren last year, who were in a better position in the tests. Raw pace maybe wasn't quite as big a step than than they were probably wanting, um, but I think that's where it's going to be quite fascinating once again behind Red Bull to see how that pack actually comes out. Um, to a situation where they can actually start to challenge Red Bull properly. Do you think the dominance has to be broken for the good of F1? Yeah, I'd, I'd say yes, um, but they all have the same rules. They all have the same opportunities. It's just the who, become, who comes out with the smartest ideas that work. You can come out with a smart idea. And I go back to that Mercedes. When it first came out, everybody was like, whoa, mm. this is something special. But the way they went about... Um, making that car work in the wind tunnel and the simulator and everything else was actually to make it really, really low to the ground, which was then their porpoising issues that we were seeing mm -hmm. with a lot of the cars a couple of years ago. And as time went by, they improved the porpoising, but they didn't actually improve the performance. And what you always see with Red Bull taking some of those elements and implementing it into into the RB20, uh, as, it, as it will be, um, that's where these clever minds are able to get the very, very best out of the team that they're working with, but then actually apply it to the car as well. And it's all the side pods. That's where all the work has been done by all the teams. A lot of them obviously have worked on in a direction of the RB19 last mm. year, dominant, dominant car. But of course, Red Bull have slightly gone again in a, in a direction that no one else has gone in other than Mercedes did a couple of years ago. Not as I said, not quite to the same extremes, but it's how you make all that airflow because it's 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 a brick effectively yeah. going in a it's straight. The aerodynamics of it. It's all. the aerodynamics yeah. of it all. But you've got to make all those little cooling ducts that are in there as small as you possibly can. But then you actually got to make them efficient mm. at the same time, and that's what Red Bull do seem to have been able to to achieve. But let's see. I don't think it's an absolute given. Um, I rephrase that. It probably is a given that he's going to win the first race, but I think there's a very good chance. I think the gap will be much, much smaller, especially uh, with that Ferrari. So there, there is this physical challenge to try and beat the advancement of the technology at Red Bull, yeah. I suppose, for the rivals. 
Is it also for the drivers trying to catch up with Max? now becoming a mental one and trying to overcome the intimidation he brings to the course. Well, that's interesting, intimidation. And that's what a driver, I think the best drivers always bring to their cockpit. It is that ability to be a little bit nervous. You look in the mirror. I remember some drivers used to look in the mirror and when they saw that yellow Ayrton Senna helmet and it's almost like they drove off the circuit because it was Ayrton Senna. So intimidation is a big part. Max has definitely got a lot of that intimidation. I think Lewis has got it. I think Charles has got... Um, and has been through a lesson that they had in Austria a couple of years ago where Max squeezed him off the circuit at the, at the, on the last lap, I think it was. Um, and then he went, OK, you want a bit of that? I'll bring it to you. So there are certain ones, like Charles, like Lewis, who can do that. And I think that is a good thing. But it's trying to stop that ball, I, even I was talking about, getting bigger and bigger and bigger, because then you have a really difficult challenge ahead, because we still haven't seen the best of Max. We haven't. No, he's not peaked yet. He's going to absorb so much more I mean, how, positive where, where energy. Where does he need to get better? But, that, but that's where the greats of the sport always are able to keep on moving with the times. As things change with, with the technology, with, with the designs of the car, 2026 is where the rules change once again. Max and Lewis and probably Charles will be those type of characters, Fernando Alonso will be those characters that will be able to just move with it. It's like a, like a car, it will do a one minute 30, level's there. You do a one, one minute 29.5, so the level's going up again. They mm. keep following mm. that line. Certain drivers only get to a certain point and then they struggle to go any faster. Um, but you, you've got to try and, you're right, stop Max from having an easy time of it and growing more with experience. So the quicker someone can stop it, then I think there is a, a better chance for them to be able to challenge him in an equal way when they're on the race tracks. But that, as I said, there are those special ones like Charles who says, OK, I'm up for that. And that's great because that's mm. exactly what we want. But of course, we've got to have cars that are very similar for that to, to happen. But that's down to the team that Charlie's in at Ferrari, obviously with Lewis going there as well. You know, they've got to get the right people and ingredients and ideas and thinking out of the box to try and get the best possible start to a season, which then means that they're actually going to be the dominant one of the year. But sticking with Red Bull, there's yep. a few issues um, around the team at the minute. First of all, let's talk about the, the, the number two driver, Sergio Perez. Mm. Uh, he's got a bit of a, a bridge to gap. Yeah. Has he not? Because, you know, you had um, Max winning all but three Grand Prix last yeah. season. Sergio won a couple. Yeah. But he seemed to have taken his eye off the ball and his, his contract's up at the end of this season. Does he start this one under a bit of pressure? Um, yes. Um, I know he's, and I know he said it last year, but he's come out and said, yeah, it's the best prepared I've ever been. And hopefully that's going to be the case. He started last season really strong, actually. He was in a really good position. I know Max Wobbly was, was a little bit unlucky at the time. In fact, but unlucky he was going for the title at one point. Yes, that's it? what I mean. Yes. You know, so Max was having a bit of, you know, luck, luck, luck wasn't, wasn't going his way. But, but Sergio was capitalising on that. And that's what you've got to do. And he did capitalise on that. But then it didn't quite sort of work out. Max sort of came back. I think it's Miami. I think that was always the key where... Sergio was on pole, Max got a penalty and he was 10th. And before halfway, Max was ahead. And then he won it by 20 odd seconds. And sometimes he was a second a lap faster in quite a few races mm. during that season. And that's, that's sort of mind blowing for a driver sometimes. But that's where you have these special guys like Max to do it. But the pressure is on Sergio, yes. Because it's not probably going to be about, right, what's my future at Red Bull? It's where my future is somewhere else. Mm. And that's going to be the key. But of course, then the fight is also who's going to replace mm. potentially Sergio. And there's also the Merck seat that's coming up as well. So someone like uh, Carlos Sainz, you would think, is probably the, is the perfect fit for both. He's got a, a history with Red Bull um, when he first came into Formula One. So maybe he's going to be the replacement there if that happens. But he'd be a good fit for for Mercedes as well. So it's quite interesting to see exactly what Sergio can do up against Max. And then he's got to be able to, and it's very unfair sometimes, because I, I hear it sort of quite often, is where they just basically sort of say, oh, he's rubbish, Sergio. Sergio Perez, he's rubbish. He's not rubbish. It's just Max, he's damn fantastic. 
And that's what you're up against. And he's, you know, he's won races in the Red Bull. He's won races when he was um, um, in other teams as well, um, in the Force India. Um, and that's where sometimes it's a bit unfair, but it's when you go up again. And I had that same situation, I guess, with, with Michael. These guys who are special are damn difficult to beat. But then the mental game is keeping yourself in the moment, doing the best that you possibly can, but actually thinking outside the box of actually trying to work out where you will end up next. And I think that's going to be the key for him. But his, his priority, of course, is trying to come out of the blocks and be strong um, against Max. Can he do that? Well, he hasn't done that yet. And if he hasn't done it yet, you probably would say, well, it's probably not going to quite happen now because when he first joined Red Bull mm. a couple of years ago, and this is what I always say, is Max better now than he was then? Yes. So it's a better Max. And is Sergio better than he was when he first came in? Well, it's much, to a much smaller degree. So it's, it's very tough mentally, but um, he's got to be thinking, I think, personally, more about where he can fit in next. But if you're Christian Horner, would you rather have one one driver win by far the majority than your second driver? Would you rather more of an equal split? Uh, again, that goes back to my sort of relationship that I had with Flavio at, at Benetton. But things are very different now. They do try very, very hard. And they do try very hard with uh, giving Sergio the, exactly the same chance as Max. But it's just when Max does something special that that wow factor comes out and as i said you're always going to steer towards what max wants and i i heard it in the test again that the it looks as if the front end is very very sharp and the best of the sport always have a sharp end and sergio struggled a little bit in the earlier days is this going to come and bite bite him in the backside again because it's max's car it's sharp at the front because you try and back away from having a sharp car mm. but you lose performance by doing that and that's where he's you've, as a driver sometimes you have to adapt to what the best will be for that car which is normally a sharp front end that will be the fastest way it might be difficult and it may be a little bit more you're wrestling the car throughout a race but it's the quickest way of doing it talking of Christian Horner obviously it's been quite an interesting few yeah. months for the team principal at Red Bull so his ongoing investigation continues mm -hmm. and no matter which way it goes do you think it leaves an element of uncertainty at the team? Um, if, if you do it as, as we are today, no, because all the hard work has gone uh, into the car for, for, you know, over the winter for what we've got today. So this was sort of a, a latter um, interference, let's say, but everything was being done. And then mm. we've seen how, how good the car and how fast the car was in Bahrain anyway. But I know there's external pressures that are sort of building up. I know Ford have come out and, you know, they're very edgy about the situation and almost want a, a quick conclusion uh, to the situation. So there's bits of it. Will it interfere with Max, for example? No, I don't think it will interfere him uh, with him at all. Will it interfere with the, the team? Again, you know, Christian's just one of those guys that's there overseeing that everything works, but effectively, it does all the positive stuff that it does quite automatically. There's a big enough team of people to be able to make that go away within the sort of the bubble of the team. So I don't think it's going to make any 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 issues to the team performances and even development down the line, because that's not what Christian's job is. His job is just to sort of make sure everything works. Then you've got Helmut Marco, who does a similar-ish job at the same time. So there's enough people that, that I don't think it will interfere with their performance from a from a season's point of view. What's your experience as a Christian? Yeah, good. Nice guy. Has always been um, a pleasure to talk to. Always a very easy guy to talk to. Um, and it's a shame that if, you know, if these rumours do come out to be to be true, which I know he's denied at the moment, um, you know, it, it will be a bit of a surprise, I suppose, from that point of view. But mm. we don't know. OK, uh, let's talk about the big news that broke um, in the kind of off season period. Uh, Lewis Hamilton's. Yes. Uh, switch. <laughs> this has got your juices. Oh, flying, I hasn't it. it. Yes. Um, from Mercedes to Ferrari. But it's not going to happen until 2025. Sure. I mean, the timing of this is quite strange in many respects because now all eyes are on Lewis all eyes are on Mercedes how does it work with Toto Wolf 
the, the you know the secretive nature of F1 we know does he involve him in all the meetings from here and the rest of the season also knowing maybe they talk about technology for next season mm. suddenly the whole thing has just become magnified yeah yeah the whole dynamics are a very very different situation but for Lewis in that cockpit in that helmet, Vita down, race goes on. It doesn't affect him at all. He knows what he's doing. He knows where he's going. He knows what he's doing. He wants to achieve uh, at Ferrari. Like he said, he wants to end on a high. Um, we'll have to see how that performance is because they haven't quite shown a better, a better competitive car than compared to last year, for example. So it looks a little bit more difficult from that point of view. Um, but I remember I was I was talking about this last year. I thought it would be the right thing for him to do. I I was always a bit edgy that can Mercedes bring it back to those those dizzy heights that it was when he won his championships. Lewis won his championships there. I wasn't sure, and he's in the sort of the twilight part of his career. And there's all the as I said, there's all the ingredients, positive ingredients that are there at Ferrari. But for some reason, they've always been a bit never come together at the right time. You know, it's 2008, um, 2007, sorry, with Kimi Raikkonen. Kimi. So it's a long, long time ago from the driver's perspective. And they were, they were close with Fernando um, and, and Sebastian. And then it sort of just slowly sort of went away, came back a little bit. End of last year actually was, was pretty good. They got a lot stronger as well. So that's a positive thing for this year, actually. They, they did actually make the car better last year doing for development so hopefully that's something that will, that will happen uh, this time around and I think it's a great time for him he's he's uh, worked with Fred Vasseur, mm. Vasseur in the past um, Fred is a very good shrewd businessman so I think he'll be able to put the right ingredients into place and especially now you've got Lewis going as well I think it would change the whole dynamic it's great with Charles Charles is doing a brilliant job and I think he's the perfect fit for the team but I think Lewis would just bring that something extra special to the team but of course his focus is going to be on this year so for Toto he's going to try and get the best out of both his drivers at this early part of the season for sure but then there will be that point where suddenly Lewis won't be seeing all the the data and won't be included in all the development programs that are going along and of course then there is the who do we who do we replace him with as well Mm. so all that's got to sort of fit out so Toto's got a bit of a a tough job I suppose coming on he's got on track stuff but he's also got all the off track stuff plus the extra off track stuff of you know trying to sort of make sure that you get the right partnership for 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 going forward with George Max Verstappen has said it makes for a potentially weird and awkward 2024 for Lewis and and the Mercedes team can you see where he's coming from? Yeah? I, I can, but it's 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 happened so many times in the past, and most of the team teams have been through it before. They've had good drivers come, they've had good drivers go. Um, so, it, is it something that's a bit of a shock to the system? No, no, not really. And they'll be able to deal with it in the right way, like I just explained. There'll be the togetherness at the beginning. Lewis knows it's going to change midway through the seasons, for example. Toto knows it's going to change. George knows it's going to change. Everybody in the team knows it's going to change. Um, but they will still try and do the best that they possibly can in whatever scenario they, fi- they find themselves in. So, no, f- from, from Max's point of view, um, it doesn't really interfere with him whatsoever. And mm. it's the, the, I suppose if you ever had a worry in your mind, um, if Max has those negative feelings or uh, uh, thoughts, I don't know. It is the power that that, that Lewis could bring to Ferrari in the in the future, next couple of years, that he could be a pain in his in his backside. <laughs> yeah. Which is what we hope. We hope we hope the Ferrari gets back to winning ways. It's great to have a Brit involved as well with Charles, um, and it will only make it fascinating he, yeah. for us because he's the the wonder kid, isn't he? On the on the circuit at the minute, Charles. And yeah, well, he's going to be an, boy. Well, he's going to be an interesting one for Lewis, actually, because when Charles came from Sauber to uh, Ferrari, it was Sebastian, and he took over that team. He took everything away from Sebastian, and it was all about Charles Leclerc. So Charles so not. Work? Well, that's what I mean. It's not going to be an easy fit. As far as is he going to be his friend? Come in, come into the team. Yes, is, there there's undis- everybody- is there an undisputed number one there? 
Uh, I think there, I think there's always that scenario that again Ferrari they try very very hard. I think even with Carlos at the moment they try very hard to make it that there are no more number ones. But it, as I said, it will always sort of move around whoever's doing better at the time. But I think that's only a great dynamic for for the team. But it's great for the drivers because if you're pushing each other, you're only going to get the best from from yourselves as well, best better performances. So I think it's a really good healthy fit. You've got the experienced man with one of the younger generations coming through who's been at Ferrari now for a, for a, f a good few years, knows how it all clicks. He knows how Fred, Fred Vasseur works, but so does Lewis. That's the great thing. They both sort of have worked with him now. And I think it's only going to be a positive thing for Ferrari and for us, because I think there is definitely, definitely a movement where Ferrari are going in the right direction, not this sort of stumbling, not quite getting it together right. To bring Lewis on board, I think, is a very, very positive thing. You mentioned Lewis not being, is in his twilight. He's not far off 40. Is he still at the peak of his powers? I, he's still got everything that is needed to win races and win a world championship. That doesn't go away. Your Fernando Alonso is your prime example of where his race craft is still second to none. You don't lose that, even when they're out there over 40 like they were. I think Nigel Mansell won one at 39, I think yeah. it was. So it just shows if you've got the motivation um, and then you're given the tools, you'll get excited and tingly and all those positive times that you've had in the past all suddenly come back because, well, that can still happen. And I think it can still happen. Yeah, but you see... By the way you've described it, that almost sounds like as if Lewis needs this new challenge because it's becoming a bit stale with him at Mercedes. Well, it's, it's not working, is it? No. And you do need a new challenge. And I think Ferrari is that always... It, a lot of people always say the dream has always got to be going to Ferrari. For me, it wasn't. It was always the dream was going to where I can win. No matter where it was. Mm. Ferrari have this wonderful, you know, historic um, dream that we still want them to win. And they've done it in the past. There's no reason why they can't do it in the future. They, with Fred Vasseur, I think it's great. With Charles, it's great. And also with Lewis at the same time. So, but as I said before, it's just all those ingredients coming together at the right time. And we've only got a short period before there is that change in, in 2026. Mm. So it's probably the perfect timing because at least it gives everybody a bit of time to understand each other. And then when everything really has to happen, um, it will happen for, for 2026. But that's 2025. In that's for 25, but it's in, the build up yeah. to 26. But in the meantime, he's with Mercedes, and yeah. I suppose it puts all the onus on them to try and provide this brilliant final swan song. Of course. While Lewis is there. Yeah. But how does that work with George Russell in this season? Well, George has just got to do his job, focus on his job. He knows he's probably going to be the team leader uh, at the end of this season. He's going to learn and has learnt a lot off of Lewis. He will continue learning um, in the next probably 10 years if he's, if he's around for that long or even more as they are nowadays. I always remember Alan Prost saying, he said, on my last lap of my last race, I was still learning. And you do. So George has just got to focus on what George does, does best, which is to drive the wheels off of the car. And we've seen him be faster than Lewis. We've seen him beat Lewis. We've seen him win. Uh, races that sprint race in um, in Brazil. Um, it's got all the ingredients, but now he's got to take charge of his de destiny as well. A little, little bit like I said about Charles Leclerc going in against uh, Sebastian Vettel. He took the team, and he's got to take the team um, to those new dizzy heights. And I think if he's able to do that. He's got the right mindset, I think, for that. Always, always the first time I ever saw him properly coming to a Formula One paddock, George. I always remember he came in, his chest was, he's quite tall, so his chest was out, he was like a peacock, his feathers were out of the back, <laughs> but he had a presence. Yeah. And that's a very important thing as well. So I think he's got all the lovely ingredients that we need. He had a bit of a struggle mid-season last year uh, towards the end, but that's just making sure that it works. As I said, said to you about Michael right the, uh, um, earlier on, it's something that you have to guide it and steer it towards what you want, what you want to have. And that will only benefit you, but it will benefit the team as well. So mm -hmm. it's, it's an important, important point, important, an important time for George. It's funny, isn't it? Because on the one hand, we're talking about the new season 
we're hoping isn't a monopoly once again with Red yeah. Bull and, uh, and Max. But because of the Lewis intrigue and how it plays out at Mercedes, it does inject fresh impetus, right? And interest. Massively. Yes. Because there is now a sense of the unknown as to how all these subplots are going to play out. Yeah, I think that's the good thing about the subplots because it's not just about Lewis, it's about all the other little fits that are going to sort of start to come together as well. And then there's a, going to be a little buzz you know, whoever comes, it goes into the Red Bull if that, if that changes or who, mm. who goes into the, the, the Mercedes. So it's great. It is Lewis, yes, but it's all the little subplots, as you said. We've got to talk about Lando Norris yeah. with McLaren. I mean, they ended last season particularly strongly and it feels like he could be at the tug of war or in a tug of war yeah. with the likes of Red Bull and Mercedes. So where do you think his head is at right now? Well, uh, his head, I think his head will be sort of focused totally on getting the best out of himself in a McLaren. That's, that's where he's, he's going to impress the team he's in, but he's also going to impress people on the outside as well. Uh, Mercedes and Red Bull, potentially, um, is, uh, is a move that might be on the cards. Um, they started last season a little bit slow, very slow, but developed it as you said really really well at the end of the season started stronger a uh, few reliability problems has it got the raw pace i'm not 100 percent sure that it's sort of where they ended last season i think they might be just a little bit, i think that little mid-pack with the aston martin for example um it's going to be a a, a a bit of a fight for them um but this is a this is a crossroads in many respects for, for Lando because he, he fits McLaren brilliantly. They've really done a good job of making him feel at home. It's great that Oscar Piastri um, pushed him uh, last season and a lot of people are talking uh, in positive ways. Maybe there's something even with Oscar as oh, well, wow. maybe moving around. But uh, I think Lando's got a good reputation and that's something that's the likes of I think Mercedes, it would be a good fit. It's another British driver. Is that, is that a negative? I don't think it is. We've just lost one Brit <laughs> for that space to come aboard, and it hasn't been a big problem. Um, and then you've got Red Bull, but that's a little bit different because he hasn't had a Red Bull relationship. Of, as I said, with Carlos Sainz has had one before, done a great job at Ferrari, especially in the last season. But also, he's in a, he's in a good position. A position uh, at McLaren as well because he feels very much that everybody's with him he feels that he's with them and sometimes you sort of go and if we look at it right Mercedes is that better than where I am now and you could have an argument well probably maybe not because mm. they're not sort of moving in a direction back to those winning ways but McLaren have made massive massive strides to be in that mix and they're going to be in that mix with Mercedes so it's going to be fascinating to see what one he can achieve with that McLaren but then secondly it's going to be a real difficult choice if they're op if that opportunity is there right it's Mercedes or McLaren which one do I go for it's got to be a bit of a gut feeling to be honest and what potentially will be able to give you um the best chances of winning races because Oscar's obviously had his had his win. Um, it hasn't quite happened. He's got very very close a couple of times. In some ways, I think it's probably better that he st he, he stays at McLaren. I think McLaren might be able to just give him that little something extra that will be of benefit. If it was a choice of going to a, a, a Ferrari or a Red Bull, you'd probably think a little bit different because you know that's going to be a potentially a, you know a car that will give you the the winning ways and the winning ways on that race he hasn't actually achieved at the moment I'm not sure the Red Bull one is makes sense uh, for me but uh, but it's all going to be down to him he's got to focus only on one thing it's getting the best performances out of himself in the McLaren for this season and then that will only probably give him a better better idea of which which way he wants to go if he has a good McLaren this year why leave how good can Lando be very good he can definitely mix it with the best. With the best, he gets criticised sometimes, maybe about his first lap, sort of wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing. But he does do that uh, uh, as well. So it's a bit of a fifty-fifty. They don't all have good first laps. Even Max and Lewis don't have the perfect first laps all the time. So it's you know he can 
definitely deliver. He's very reliable. I think that's a really good strength to have. And when you're reliable, that's something the team wants. The team are always expecting us mm. to be a bit robotic. We've got to be the same every single time. And I think Lando effectively has that ability to be able to do that. So he's got a lot of positive um, elements that would be very useful for, for another team. But at the present time, they're very useful for, for what McLaren need. Yeah, we've got the new venues that have been integrated, um, the big cities, Madrid's been involved yeah. now, Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And it's it's strange, at the cost of maybe the more traditional circuits making way, Nuremberg's not on the no, calendar. No, Hockenheim. Yeah, it's Hockenheim. been on there for ages, yeah. Exactly. I mean, do you think this is to serve a new audience now? Or do you think we're losing a bit of the tradition of F1? Well, we've still got races. We've still got Spa, we've still got Silverstone, Monza, for example, Hungary. You know, they're still a big part uh, of the calendar. And it's something that we still need to keep the old historic racetracks on the calendar. I think um, F1, Liberty Media, they're still, they know that. Mm. They know how important it is to have those historic tracks. But it's like anything, everything moves on. Um, some of the tracks that they were racing in the 60s and 70s and 80s we don't go to anymore. You said Nürburgring and Hockenheim, for example. But then there are tracks that we used to go to that we don't any, any, anymore, even going further back. So it always changes, mm. it always changes. And the new circuits that have come on board, you can criticise them sometimes, so whether the racing is a little bit boring, but there are races in Europe, European races that are not... Um, brilliant either uh, just because the characteristics of of the layout of the of the, of the circuit so they're, they're not all brilliant um but it's it's something that it's like vegas you know there was some criticism about the whole las vegas way the driver presentation and all the lights that were going on and the the, the, top, the probably the the only mistake was the time the timing was a bit out actually it was far too late into the into the morning <laughs> they were they were sort of on track it was a decent time <laughs> it was really, you know, well they were, yeah the casino was still sort of going but uh, yes yeah, so that was probably the only thing but the rest of it i think the presentation i know max was sort of quite outspoken sort of saying you know i feel like i'm a bit of a puppet mm. he's all i'm only here to do the racing but it's it is a part of it now you know that's f1 as a whole it's it's sport as a whole i think everything moves on and the presentation of a driver for example is a chance for those fans who are absolutely jam-packed in that grandstand to see them otherwise they see them from a distance generally they've always got a helmet on mm. so they don't see their face so it's a bit of an interaction i think that needs to come into play and i think that's the the modern side of f1 but it's only good for the sport at the end of the day you know the netflix effect is something that's that's been fantastic but we still want to see the faces we still want to see see the characters coming coming out and that's something that I still is an important thing so those new circuits miami being one of the other ones i think it's good i don't i don't always understand why people criticize it. well it's not a good thing miami it was it's rubbish race was great so mm. the race worked so what's wrong with that there was talk about oh the surf it was a bit slippery and it was a bit difficult it's not difficult come on that's that's the whole point it's not, meant to be it's easy. not supposed to no. be easy so i th i think all those new challenges are are, are are a good thing so let's put you on the spot finally uh your prediction for the title and the constructors um, I'm, I'm probably unfortunately going to go the same way as last year. I think Max will still be able to, to achieve it with Red Bull. But I am, I am not 100% sure exactly how quick that Ferrari is. I hope there has been a little bit of a turn down of the, the power uh, in, in the Bahrain test, which I'm sure um, Red Bull were doing at the same time. But the real big positive is that the car is better with the tyres. The degradation is something they can control much, much more, which mm. will only make them stronger in a race uh, situation. That's how the, the races are won and the championships done. So I think the fight is going to be between Red Bull and Ferrari, and then the rest will be sort of um, fighting it out behind them. Um, but it's going to be interesting because it, we, we may be talking about a Red Bull at the, now, but there's a chance, you know, four or five races, six races time, it could twist around a little bit as well. So hopefully that twist will come into play, but I can only do it on what we've seen so far. Yes. And the Red Bull does yes. look very but good. But watch this space. Exactly, yeah. indeed. Johnny, you've been brilliant company. Thanks so much for coming in. Enjoyed it. 
Johnny Herbert, who has been in the zone in association with Gambling Zone, your trusted online gambling comparison site.